Hello, and welcome to Bringing Education Home. I'm Herb. And I'm Christina. And together, we bring you experts and ideas to help grow healthy, happy, successful families that are both inside and outside the box. If you like the show, be sure to follow Christina on Facebook. And please leave us a like review on your favorite podcast platform. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing DJ Nicholson. DJ is an educational coach with a lifelong passion for education and ensuring that neurodivergent kids and those with learning support needs are engaged and supported in their educational environment. She coaches parents in IEP and educational planning awareness and approaches parent empowerment with kindness and compassion. She has been committed to serving special education professionals, parents, and kids for the past 30 years as a teacher, a coach, and a trainer. DJ's superpowers include creating unique learning opportunities for kids, problem solving for their success, and helping parents see what's possible for their kids' best learning. When she's not engaged in her career passions, she is volunteering with a pug rescue group, mentoring young teachers, and doing yoga. Welcome, DJ. It is a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much. It's so nice to be here. I'm looking forward to our conversation. It is so much fun to talk to another educator in the the world, right? Because I have lived that world for 27 years. You've been in the world for several, several years. I love how we can take these conversations and not just talk about it in an education standpoint, but what's best for families and children. So thank you for joining us to have this important conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I would actually like to start off today by trying to know what you mean by neurodivergent, because that term is so broadly used today and it means so many different things. And recently I've been called neurodivergent, but on the upper scale. So I'm like a really smart person with, um, so I'm I'm above the divergent curve would be a good way to put it. But (laughs) most people, when they hear neurodivergent, they think of typically disabled children, people with learning disabilities. What what does neurodivergent mean to you and how do you interpret it in the educational environment? So the simplest way to describe it is uh, neurodivergency is anyone that has a, a different thinking brain. So any, any, and because we're talking about children, I'll just refer to kids, you know, any kid that thinks differently has a different perspective on things and might need to look at learning in a different way with different tools and different resources. And so, you know, people will say to me, well, you know, what disabilities are considered neurodiverse? And I, I am a huge component proponent of uh, not continuing to label children if we don't have to, if they simply have different thinking brains, they ju- they're just different thinkers. But, you know, most of society would think of, you know, neurodivergent thinkers as, you know, kids that are on the autism spectrum, kids with ADHD, dyslexia, dyscalculia, dysgraphia, things, you know, labels, um, differences such as that would really be considered neuro neurodivergent. And so really, those different thinking brains make up so much of our kids, whether it's kids in the classroom, kids that are being homeschooled, whatever that looks like. We have kids that have very different different thinking abilities. And I, I think it's so important that that we honor that, that we honor the different thinking brains and stop trying to fit kids inside of the box that was really built a hundred years ago. I love that because that gives us a starting point for this discussion, right? And it also helps us understand what we're talking about when we say that we're neurodivergent. Because like you said, it comes from so many different directions that even some of our parents, some of our audience might be like, oh, well, does that mean it's this kind of kid or that kind of kid? And I completely understand. Yeah, that totally makes sense from the discussion point that we're going to be heading from. And just one thing I like to say about that is that, you know, even though we don't want to necessarily label kids. When I was in the classroom, those labels helped me understand maybe where the child was coming from and then spring forward. I was one of those people that looked at the box and then set it aside and said, okay, what can I do outside of the box or different than people have tried before to help this child? So yeah, I understand we don't want to label too much, but at the same time, sometimes narrowing it down gives you a springboard to help them a little bit more. Absolutely. And I think, you know, those of us that are, you know, seasoned educational professionals, we we can look at it like that. But I I know just from recent experience, I've had, you know, I did a, a teacher workshop series where, you know, someone asked me the question, well, you know, I, I, I'm going to have a, a kiddo in my class this coming school year that's autistic. What do I do? Right. 
And so it's not the idea of, you know, one size fits all based on a disability or a diagnosis or a label or whatever you want to call it. It really is like, I think the purpose of the label is knowing what the difference is. And then as a teacher or a parent or whoever's providing that education to the child that you have, you know, a huge toolbox in which to, to pull from, because not everything works for every kid that has a different thinking brain. Exactly. Yeah. It's just like whenever you're sitting in a classroom with 30 kids, you know, you can't teach them all the same. That's why whenever I would go into lesson planning and things, I would try to make sure the different learning styles, the kinesthetic, the auditory, the visual, I would try to create lessons that had as much of that incorporated as possible so that one kid could track one way another kid could track a different way and we'd all get to the other side hopefully with a similar understanding yeah right, personally right. i was i i from my point of view i was actually kind of disappointed when the the labels went away because you could like she was saying you could know how to to address or talk to a person now there's such a wide variety of stuff that's neurodivergent because that term is i guess less offensive than some of the terms that were, were used before. But to me, they weren't offensive. They were like, okay, this is a set of characteristics that this person has, and this is how it, you can better communicate with that person. Just like in some of the personality profiles, like the Meyer-Briggs type index, mm -hmm. if you know the person's MBTI, then it gives you a baseline for a way you can talk to that person to help get through to them in, in the way that works better for them but just, just say neurodivergent, then, then you have to come at things from a whole different perspective and you don't have as much information to start with. So that was why I was asking you that question and I loved the way you answered it. So thank you. You're welcome. And I just want to piggyback on what you said too. So absolutely agree with, with the way we support has to be specific, but I know just as an example, so I, I live in Florida and, and in my state, kids, you know, what their exceptionality might be specific learning disability, but specific learning disability doesn't tell us anything about how the child processes, if they have dyslexia, if they have whatever it is, it's kind of that it became that blanket umbrella term. Yeah. And so it, it left teachers and parents with this kind of, okay, well, you know, my kid or my student has a learning disability. Now what? You know, I mean, is, yeah. is it processing? Are, are they visual learners? What's, what's the, what's the meat behind that exceptionality? And so to label a child with just a specific learning disability, well, that doesn't really, that doesn't tell us anything, mm -hmm. but if we have specific information, so, you know, say, you know, we, ha we have a kid that's autistic, mm -hmm. we, we have information that backs it up we've we've done evaluations we have cognitive testing we have all the different pieces that we need in order to get a better sense of who of who the kid is and that's what that's what we really want to know and so you know christina to what you said before like that is what helps teachers when they when they understand what different kids need when they look at that at that paperwork and they can read through an IEP or a 504 plan they get a much better idea of what it what it is that 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 kid needs absolutely so for our parents who are listening and this goes into kind of what you kind of work with and teach with when you have a child that maybe it did just get a brand new label or they did just get a new diagnosis well, how do you help them or what questions can they ask to narrow that down? Because maybe they don't understand what the school is saying or the expert that's working with them is saying, what kind of questions could they ask that would like, yeah, narrow that down and help them know, oh, I need to get this for my child or I should really look into this program for my child. Okay, so before I even answer that question, because I think that's such a great question, I think we have to talk about just kind of, and I'm going to talk about this from the perspective of like an educational system. Yeah. So not not homeschooling, but the, the system of education as a whole. So what what I find now is because, you know, edu our educational systems are so in flux right now. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of very seasoned teachers are retiring early. We're losing our very best veteran teachers that have been, you know, around for a long time. Right. I'm right. right. Christina and I both, yep. 
you know, we're lo we're losing these veteran teachers, and and you know, sadly, in in a lot of places across the country, they're being replaced by, you know, best case scenario, a brand new teacher that's excited yeah. and ready to go and is willing to learn and has all the fire behind them yeah. in order to go in and and teach in the classroom. That's the best case scenario, but there's also scenarios where you know, people have decided, you know, that they want to have a second career and they go into the classroom and, and they're in the classroom with no formal training yet mm -hmm. because they're hired as teachers first, then they go on and they get the, get the training. And so I think while that's the case for teachers, it's also the case for anybody that's on a school staff, you know, speech and OT and the psychologists and social workers and everything. And so I tell parents, I suggest to parents that they are only as knowledgeable as the people that are sitting around the table with them. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is really important. And teachers and um, parents have really honed in on like, oh, my goodness, like, well, I'm a, you know, my my kid's teacher was a brand new teacher. And I said, and that and that's wonderful. There's a lot of you know room there to grow and build that toolbox. But as a parent, I want you to be able to sit confidently in an IEP meeting or whatever educational meeting there is. And you know, because you know your kid the best, mm -hmm. that you know what the possibilities are and what you want to ask for. And so we, parents and I talk a lot about, you know, I, I call it, you know, the what, the why, and the how, because sometimes we know what we want for our kids, but we don't know why. Mm -hmm. And then we don't know how to ask for it. And so I think that it's, you know, I always look at, look at it as like a three pronged, you know, kind of conversation, like, and just so in, in having those conversations with parents, we talk about all the different elements of learning in a classroom. So if, so for example, if there's a parent that has, you know, a, a kiddo with a brand new IEP and he's in the third grade and he's two years below reading level, but yet he's expected to understand grade level content. Well, I want parents to know, well, I want, I want you to be confident in asking for um, text to speech yeah. as an accommodation and as a piece of assistive technology, because that way your child has access to that grade level content and also pairs as a support when they're reading it doesn't take away from the fact that they're not reading at grade le level yet but it's it's a support and so the the so that would that's the the what and the why and then the how is just simply saying you know i understand that my child you know isn't reading on grade level yet um as as members of the school team what would you suggest as an accommodation or a support for my child and then if they don't say well assistive technology would be great maybe they have some other ideas but then the parent because we've had conversations can confidently say hey you know knowing my child the way i do i've had these conversations let's with you know with with a with an educational coach we've looked at data we know that he's not successful in this area what supports can we put into place to build his success and build his independence. Yes, exactly. And just to clarify that for somebody who doesn't quite understand, when she says text to speech, that means that it's reading the book out loud for them. So they're still accessing the same same book as the rest of the class when they're learning content, but they are having it read to them so they can process it without having to try to struggle through the words and read it and not comprehend because they can't read the words. Absolutely, right. And so they're able to comprehend that grade level mm -hmm. content while building their reading ability and there's there and so if a, if a kid has a print disability of any kind mm -hmm. there are multiple um resources out there for kids with print disabilities that are absolutely free for schools so even things like you know learning ally and bookshare mm -hmm. are readily available um, at least in, in the public in the public sector, they're available for free, but private schools um, and homeschool would be, um, I think there's a charge for that. But yeah. there's multiple, multiple different online resources. Right. And I mean, just using features like Google and, and Microsoft, there's so many tools um, built into that. Yeah, 
Absolutely. And I love how you just connected that with our audience who are homeschoolers and you're like, oh, well, I, we don't have any of that available. Yeah, you do. You just have to go find it. And Google is one of those great things that is available basically free for everybody. So just follow that, go find it. Mm -hmm. Yes. And actually Google has so many amazing extensions. Mm -hmm. yes. um, oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, amazing extensions. Um, for focus and um, for, you know, that text to speech where, where it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a real person's voice. It's not a robot. Yeah. Um, I actually, I know this because I use it for myself <laughs> when, I, when I'm doing a correction on something. If I, you know, if I'm getting something ready to send out, mm -hmm. I put it in text to speech because I want, I want to be able to hear it because yeah. sometimes I can, you know, I'll read through something and it makes sense when I read it. And then I, oh no, no, that the should have been a two. Yes. I love that. Yeah. Okay. So tip, tip for people, adults who are listening, use the tools for editing and making things better. Right. <laughs> love it. Right. Because when, you know, when you think about it, I mean, so, you know, we, we've talked, you know, briefly about our own, you know, neurodivergencies and yeah. I know I have so many tools that I use, uh -huh. but it helps me be really productive mm -hmm. and increases my focus. And so as an adult, I know how to, I know how to do that. I think it's equally important that we share that with kids. So mm -hmm. kids know how to do it and that we empower, when we empower parents and give them tools, then they can then empower their kids. Because what we don't want to have is an adult that hovers over a child pointing to where they are on the page. Oh, you got to be here. Pay attention. You got to do this. That hovering, hovering, hovering that I That's see, really you know, funny. just just so much. Nobody wants to be hovered over like that. It's really uncomfortable. And for any kid that has, you know, um, like a, sen a sensory mm -hmm. concern where somebody's in their personal space and they're overwhelmed and like, I, I couldn't have that. I couldn't have somebody standing over me all day. I would lose my mind. But if we teach kids, then they become independent and they don't need, they, they become aware of the tools that they need. Um, and if we look at kids as all different thinkers mm -hmm. and provide kids with, Hey, these are tools. These are just things that you can use. I mean, in, in my ideal world, every kid knows what to use to maximize their independence and their learning and that it's okay. And that okay part is a big one because some parents are like, oh no, if you're using that stuff, then you're cheating. You're not really doing the work, et cetera, et cetera. And that's something that parents really have to look at. Are you creating an independent learner that can move forward on their own? Or are you causing them to be dependent on you because you won't let them use the tools? Now, am I advocating for AI writing their paper? Absolutely not. Right. But am I saying, can they speak the paper? And the computer type it for them, the speech to text, the opposite of what we were just talking about. Absolutely, because we know that some kids need that support to be successful. Well, and you know, that just makes me think about the whole idea of, of learning, learning outcomes, you know, mm -hmm. as, as a teacher and as a parent who's homeschooling at home, what's, you know, what's the learning outcome? And so just to use your example of, of writing and using um, speech to text, mm -hmm. Do you want a child writing with a pencil to exhaustion or do you want them to be able to jot down some things in a graphic organizer or jot things down in a, in a little, you know, outline kind of a form and mm -hmm. then be able to speak it into a computer program and capture the expression behind what it is that they want to write, but they're not quite able to do it yet. Mm -hmm. And that totally, totally makes sense because then you can see the creativity and the beauty and the amazingness of that child. And they aren't hindered by a disability or are hindered by something that isn't working quite right. Now, does that mean that you give up on teaching them that stuff? No, you keep Absolutely. teaching it, right. but you allow them to be independent as much as possible. Now, a few words about vibrant family education. How many entrepreneurs and business owners start out on this journey to make a better life for their family, only to find that it took so much more time and effort than they were expecting that they had even less time for their family? I know I did. 
At Vibrant Family Education, we want to help you reach your family goals while you're still building towards your business goals. We do this by bringing you the third leg of the stool to keep your family upright, family education development. By bringing your children's education home, you will be able to model your work ethic and family values as you overcome obstacles and challenges to build your business. Instead of learning facts to pass tests, your children can be watching and seeing the dedication it takes to build your business and the legacy you want to create for their future. They will be able to witness the struggles and joys, the wins and the losses, and learn from you how to persevere and grow in life. Instead of waiting until you get successful to spend more time with your family, start with the end goal in mind and bring your family home. Instead of trying to repair your family after you reach success, let us help you start achieving your family goals from the outset. Learn to be successful with your family now, and no matter what happens in the future, they will be better prepared for life, especially after watching how you cared for and built not only a business, but a healthy, healthy, happy, and successful family. We offer a wide range of educational services, including how to easily get started with homeschooling. Come visit us at vibrantfamilyeducation.com and let us show you how. And now back to our guest. Well, and you know, that also speaks to just, you know, developmental levels in kids. You know, I, I, I wrote, I wrote a blog article last year about how to, how to build the handwriting skills and hand strengths for mm -hmm. little kids. Because, you know, when you look at a four-year-old's hand, the skeleton and the structure of a four-year-old's hand is not the same as a seven or eight-year-old. So a lot of four-year-olds, they're absolutely not ready to write. Neither are five-year-olds or six-year-olds, depending on their size. Right. But I had, I had a, a preschool teacher comment on my blog and say, well, I've seen, I've seen it done this way. And she lays out an entire scenario about how, you know, she had a, a coworker that would, that would wrap a rubber band around the child's hand so they could hold the pencil. And I was like, oh no, oh no, that's that's not that's not a pre-writing skill. That's no. not a support. That's not mm -hmm. and that's not any of of that. And so, you know, I we, I kind of took it back and like if you read the article, this right. you know, this is, you know, it's it's Plato, it's Theraputty, it's Legos, it's build it's all the things that we we need kids to have first. And it's the before. chunky Sorry, the chunky pencil, the and chunky by laying the wider diameter pencil and crayons and things that those kids can grab easier when they're ready. Right. And I even I wonder if I, I was actually looking over here to see if I oh had God. one of my little pencils. I don't see it. I have these like little itty bitty golf pencils that uh -huh. actually have erasers on them. So okay. it's, you know, it's a typical pencil, yeah. but it's it's shrunk down to about, you know, this big. Yeah. And so this can be overwhelming for kids because it's a lot to balance. But then if you then, you know, put like an eraser on the top of it, now it's really unbalanced and it doesn't yeah. feel, it doesn't feel right if you don't have the hand strength to hold it. And uh -huh. so again, like you said, Christina, the, the thicker pencils, uh, uh -huh. pencil grips, all different kinds of pencil grips out yeah. there. And then little tiny golf pencils, like why, why wouldn't we use something that actually fits a little kid's hand? Like this fits my hand, but this doesn't fit a little itty bitty hand. Yeah. Amazing. So switching yeah. to the other end of the spectrum. So there's a lot of highly intelligent children. The, uh, the special cases, you know, that tend to get left behind because they don't need a lot of work. And so there's not a lot of attention paid to them and they kind of fall through the cracks because they're able to just skate through and don't, don't get the abilities to learn the same way because stuff just falls to them. How do you start addressing the 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 other end of the neurodivergence, the high end, where the kids kind of get ignored because they they just kind of get it, but they're not really getting it. So I I think you know it's a lot of the same idea, except we would flip the script a little bit and focus more on what can we do for enrichment that's going to give them possibly another avenue and able in order to um, kind of digest and process what it is that they're learning. Well, so let, let me be a little more specific. So I was ignored <laughs> a lot in high school because I, I, I basically kind of outthought my teachers. So I would just sit in the back of my classroom and read all day and not pay attention. And then they would ask me a question and then I would like pop up, look at it, give them the answer and then go back to my reading. 
So right. when I got to college and it was time for me to actually start studying stuff, I didn't know how. I, I wasn't able to to have the study skills because it for me, if it didn't come super easy at that point, then it's like I just didn't know where to go or what to do. So I would do something different. So, again, that that it's it's almost like I was ignored so much that I didn't understand how to learn or to have study skills or, or to to create that kind of a growth within myself. And I, and I see that happening. I saw that happening in some of in some of the stuff where what, what Christina did, because she would like put the really high learners sometimes with the kids who were on the lower spectrum so that they could kind of help teach the lower kids. But then the, the upper kids weren't necessarily getting challenged or learning. They were getting frustrated because they were having to work down. Right. So I guess there. so I'm hearing you say kind of kind of two things. So there's the idea of, you know, kids that that are like you were saying, like outthink the teacher that needs something, they need something else. They're, they're bored in class. They're sitting in the back, they're doing their own thing to take, you know, as an example, to take a book that they're reading and, and give them additional application for that. Like, you know, go on, I, then I, now I want you to pick a book that is the the opposite uh, point of view of that and do a compare and contrast something like that where their 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 brains have to have to kind of shift in a in a different way because they need more stimulation it does that make sense mm -hmm. yeah and then so the then the other side of that is you know with the study skills and and truthfully i've i've never worked with kids on study skills because my end has always been the you know the dis, the disability um disability side of things but i do know one of the things i share with um with parents and with teachers is just the idea of knowing how to have focus time. And that when you sit down to study or plan, whatever it is, if you've got, you know, a half an hour to plan or study for something, how are you going to best use that time and teaching kids? You know, if you've got 30 minutes, you can get so much more accomplished in 30 minutes with focus time than you can in an hour and a half. So, you know, I would, I would teach kids how, how to effectively chunk things up into that, those digestible bites, set some timers, um, and be, and really kind of structure, structure it more. I know just personally, that's, that's something that, that works for me. I, when I have days, my brain's all over the place, but if I have structured focus time for half an hour, I can, I can knock out three hours when I, when I give myself that, but I had to learn how to do that. So I, th I think that's important, you know, for kids too, that if they have a half an hour, how are they using it? Exactly. You know, limit, limiting distractions, providing, yeah. providing timers. Yeah. And that's a really good one because uh, I mean, so many of us are so distracted anymore because of all the technology, because the go, 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 the busyness of the schedule, trying to split up A, B, and C. If we don't teach our kids specifically how to handle those situations, they're not going to necessarily just get it through osmosis. You know, some people handle it really well and they can watch their mom and dad to handle it and learn it. But it's mm -hmm. one of those things I really think we need to specifically teach all kids. We, we do. And I think, you know, when I was in school, when I feel like when we all were in school, you yeah. know, when we took notes on something, mm -hmm. it was you had a piece of paper with it was a white sheet of paper with blue lines on it and you had a pencil and you took notes. And we just, I mean, I, we were never taught how to take notes. It was just like, I just wrote down, I, I tried to write yeah. down everything because that's what I thought I was supposed to do. But for kids now, there's so many great ways for kids not to, not to necessarily take notes, but to take what they've written yeah. or heard or recorded or whatever it is, and then put it down in some kind of organized visual format. You know, it's the beauty of graphic organizers and having a visual representation that organizes all of the things that you need to know. I was a rotten note taker. Um, <laughs> when I was in school, we actually had dictation where you would have to like write what the teacher was saying. So I moved from a from a from a suburb of L.A. to a really small school in Southern Oregon between the second and third grade. When I was in second grade in California, we were learning still how to write. When in third grade, when I got there, 
they were already writing in cursive. And so the whole writing stuff fell apart for me. Yeah. And so even, even in college, if I tried to take notes, I missed so much more of what the professor said than if I just sat there and listened and absorbed it all. And again, my, my, I'm neurodivergent. That my brain, brain. works different. If I took notes, I learned less. If I just sat there and paid attention to what everybody else was doing and what everybody else was thinking. And then I would ask, you know, it, it's kind of weird. There was times where the professor would be talking and I would look around and I would see that other people in the class weren't understanding what the professor was saying. And so I would ask questions of the professor until other people in the class understood what he was talking about. And so in a way, and, and then the professor would say, wow, those were great questions. How'd you come up with that? And it's like, well, cause I saw other people not, <laughs> not understanding. understanding. <laughs> And so, right. and so it it kind of it kind of made me as like so I thought I understood so I asked questions to make sure and then once everybody came to like a consensus of understanding it's like okay good I was on the right track so I got again I got more by not taking notes than I did for taking notes and so in the long run still when I try and write stuff down I lose more information than I gain so it's it's kind of a weird thing for me. But that's also you having a deeper understanding of how it is that you best learn and retain information. Mm -hmm. So that makes me then want to say, you know, even with kids, especially as they get older, to give them permission and give them freedom and have the conversations about this, you know, just from the, the educator, parent, homeschooling perspective, like to talk to kids and say, what is the best way for you to learn and begin to start absorbing this? Do you want to record what, what we're talking about? Do you want to get, do you want me to, to share information with you and then give you something to read? Do you want to take notes? Like how, how does it best work for you? And even so, you know, even things like giving kids permission to stand up and move while they're listening. You know, for, for to you know, in a traditional school, to let kids like stand in the stand in the back of the classroom and and rock back and forth on on both of their feet, so they're getting that like that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, they're get, they're getting that seriously, stimulation on both seriously sides. Staring out the window and watching the clouds and letting the voices and stuff wash over me helped me a lot because when I would sit and try and watch and stare at what the teacher was doing. It, it would feel so confining, I would get lost. But by not looking at it, I could I could then peripherally take in the information. And again, so I, I'm a weird case. Normally when kids are staring out the window, they're not paying attention. attention. When I'm staring at the window, it actually helps me understand what's going on better because my eyes aren't involved specifically with what's yeah, happening here. at the same yeah. time. You're right. definitely auditory. <laughs> Yeah, but but again, it, it goes back to, you know, honoring the learning styles of different kids, honoring the different kinds of brains that kids have. Um, and a good example of that is several years ago when I was still working in the public system, I was coaching at a school and I had a teacher who was endlessly frustrated by a kid that would not stop doodling. Every time she was doing a read aloud, this was in a third grade classroom. Yeah. Anytime she was doing a read aloud, he was doodling on his paper. And she would get really upset with him and she would make him like crumple it up in a ball and throw it away. And oh, so I, I, I know, I know. Sorry. <laughs> Me as her, a teacher, I knew. Yeah, I knew. That yeah, that, just, that, that hurts my teacher heart so much. And so, you know, I finally said to her, I said, why do you think he's doodling? Mm -hmm. She says he's not paying attention. I said, but when you ask him questions, when you ask him to talk to a shoulder partner or work in a small group, is he, is he engaged? Is he collaborating with his peers? Is, do you feel like he's understanding what it is that, that, that you're reading or what they're supposed to do? She goes, well, I guess. Yeah. And I said, okay, so let's, let's, let's think about this then. If he's doodling, mm -hmm. but he's still focused in his independent or partner group work, whatever it is, is he learning? Mm -hmm. And if you took and you take that away from him, mm -hmm. is learning still happening? And is there comprehension and, and all of that still happening? So I, you know, and I say to her, I said, sometimes, some, absolutely, some, sometimes we have kids, they're doodling and they're not paying an ounce of attention. 
But when you know your kids and you could talk to them about why they're doing something, if you had asked him, he might have said, you know, Miss Smith, this really is just the best way for me to stay focused. And so sometimes the doodle, the doodling is is a focus. Sometimes something in their hands doing something is is a focus tool. It's and one that, of those, blew, that blew her mind. Yeah. And it's one of those things that the way I handled that, because I, of course I had that and those kids drove me nuts for a while until I said, Hey, I'm going to allow you to doodle, but if you can try to doodle or draw what you're kind of hearing, so you're processing it as well. And for some kids that was the fix. I knew that they were paying attention because all of a sudden they had little pictures that were matching at the story or matching the chapter that I was reading and things like that. So it was very, very doable. And again, like you said, the teacher definitely needs to, or the parent in this case, maybe you're doing read alouds at home, right? And you right. want your children to pay attention more, right? Then ask them, is this helping you process? Are you actually paying attention? Can you answer those questions? And that goes back to the other kids that you were saying, like standing up in the back of the room, moving back and forth. Right. I tell the homeschool parents, your child doesn't have to sit at a table or a desk to do their reading. If they want to walk in circles in the living room as they're reading, as long as they're processing and learning, let it happen. And that's part of the beauty of that homeschool thing is that you're not de dealing with 30 kids wanting to walk around. You only have like one or two, right? But right. Absolutely. That movement, those doodles, those things, as long as they're being used productively, let it happen. Yeah. So I can explain this a little more now after hearing this. Yeah. So if I had all of my stuff taken away, if I wasn't looking out, if I had to focus in on the teachers, then I would go inside. I would go into my brain and I wouldn't be able to hear anymore. And I would get lost in my imagination mm -hmm. and I would just disappear inside of myself oh, and of yeah. what I was feeling if I had to pay attention to that. But if I was able to do something outside of myself, then it kept me outside of myself and that mm -hmm. information could come to me. Yeah. But if I had right. to focus on it, I lost, I went inside and I lost myself inside of me. Yeah. And again, that's, that's that weird out of the box stuff, the, you know, the language that I was talking about. So you guys just helped me clarify that a lot. So even now I take a lot of classes. I, I'm like, I'm taking an internal family systems class. If I sit there and I watch the guy talking and I watch the people, then I, I, I go off. But if I'm sitting there just randomly doing playing solitaire on my phone while that's happening, yeah. I'm outside of myself. And because I'm outside of myself, then more stuff can come in. So that's, that's a really interesting thing. So, so thank you for explaining that because that's oh. what you bring, bring more to me. So that was that's awesome. what we're here for. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> and hopefully the audiences are listening to this conversation It's setting up those little light bulbs for them or for their children is like, oh yeah, I can do this and this and this to help my child now that I understand this whole dynamic. Because yeah, maybe better. your children's fidgeting is to help them get outside of themselves so because the focus. learning is happening out there. And yeah. if they don't have something to bring them out, then they go inside and get lost. And so right. that's, that's, yeah for parents with with kids who need to fidget or do something or, or seem like they're always ignoring you but then when you do ask them it's like no i'm i'm listening this is what you said but then when they you they you look at them and then they can't remember anything you said so you know that that is yeah. something very important to try and pay attention to well and i think too you know whether whether it's parents at home or teachers is just you know giving them permission I think we have to give them permission that it, that it's not everybody has to sit in, you know, the proverbial blue plastic chair. They don't have to sit at the kitchen table. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's really looking at those at, at a learning outcome or a, or a task outcome. What do you, what do you want at the end of this? You know, if you're, if you have a kid that can lay on the floor or lay in a beanbag chair and read for 30 minutes, completely focused wouldn't you rather have that than have the kid that you, where you insist that they sit at a table or a kitchen table or their desk or whatnot, and they only read for five minutes and then they're fidgety and they're wiggly because they're not comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same way with writing. I've talked to, you know, parents and I've suggested with parents is like, if it's actual handwriting practice where you're trying to get them to make their letters correctly and to be super legible, et cetera. Yes. then they probably need to be sitting at a table or a hard surface that they can work at. Right. If you, they're just trying to get ideas down. If they're just trying to get a rough draft of their story written down, 
It can be in the middle of the floor. It can be under a tree in the, at the park. It could be on the window with dry erase markers that you take a picture of or something. There's yeah. so many different ways to get just kids to get the writing out, you right. know? And then you save those times that you really need the clean stuff for the sitting down or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. And those are the things that I love to share with, yeah. with parents and teachers, just that, you know, like creative solutions mm -hmm. to make things work for, for you and your kid, because at the end of the day, you know, we, we can teach until we turn green, but we want mm -hmm. kids to learn. And mm -hmm. so there's such a big difference. Like I, you know, teaching and learning are not the same thing. Mm -mm. Nope. Mm -mm. Absolutely. So if we had something else that you really wanted to tell parents during this conversation to kind of help them think about how they help their child when their child's learning something different or learn differently than other kids, what was something else that you really wanted to make sure you gave as a message to those parents? Just to know that it goes back to what I was saying at the beginning about, you know, the, the knowledge of the people of people that are at the school level supporting your child. Mm -hmm. Parents have to know what's possible. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, parents just they don't know what they don't know and and there's a there's a level of overwhelm especially when you have an IEP and you've got a diagnosis and there's all this language coming at you. Um and I tell parents too this is really important is like have a person have your person that you can go to. So whether it's me or another coach or whoever it is, but don't, don't go out there, right? Don't go out there on the internet and Google everything mm -hmm. because that is overwhelming. You have to have conversations with a seasoned educational professional that's going to help you help your child. You don't want, you don't need all the information about everything in the world about autism. You don't need that. You need somebody that's going to talk to you about your kid, help you understand the, the best scenario for your kid to, to learn in so, so they can be confident in, in, what, in what they're doing, whether it's homeschool or in a traditional setting, but have a person. That. Yeah, absolutely. Person. I want to piggyback on that. And, you know, like you were saying, also, depending on the level of expertise at that table, you as the parent might actually know what's best for your child, right? Yeah. Now you can't go in there and demand 20 different things, especially if you're still working in the public schools because mm -hmm. they do have limitations, but can you pick two or three of the best things that you know that work with your child and make that be implemented in that, pro in that plan if they don't have some good suggestions kind of things? Well, and I think, I think that's what, that's what I talk to parents about a yeah. lot. You know, we can, we can talk about all, all these tools that we think would work or might work or that we want to try, but let's, let's pick the, the couple that are going to give us the most bang for our buck. Yep. Um, that will, that will work across multiple, um, multiple academic areas. Yeah. The 80, yeah. 20 rule, 20% 20 of what you do is responsible for 80% of your outcomes. So yeah, that's true. Focus, yeah. Focus yeah. on, focus on the things that give you, that give you the most. So yeah. doing, doing 10 things will, will not, work but doing two or three can give you an 80 percent get you 80 percent of the way there so right yeah absolutely absolutely yeah. well dj this has been an awesome awesome conversation and thank you for your tidbits everything that you've been dropping along the way would you make sure that you say out loud for our audience and of course everything will be down in the show notes but how do okay. they get a hold of you if they want a little bit more information or if they find out that you know you're the one that can really help them with their situation Okay. Um, so my business is called Inclusiveology because I believe every kid can be included in learning. And my website is www.inclusiveology.com. And so they can go there and find everything that they need for parents, teachers, getting a hold of me, or they can, they can also find me on Facebook. I have a page on Facebook um, and Instagram. Excellent. Perfect. 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 And as oh, we're wrapping up. Huh? And LinkedIn. LinkedIn too, oh, if they LinkedIn. Want to, you know, to get down to the nitty gritty of all the stuff that I've ever done. Go there. Go there. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Exactly. <laughs> awesome. So parents, audience, thank you for being with us. This has been one of our talks that, you know, really bring in those different perspectives, those different ideas. How do we help our child the most and taking that message away that you as a parent usually know your child best. And working with those professionals, working with that coach, you can really find a way to serve your child and their education needs the best. So do that. 
find those people that can really help you be your child's advocate and really work together to make the education the best it can be for your child, whether it's in the public schools or you decide to take them out and to homeschool them instead. Absolutely. And DJ, I, I would like to thank you for being here. In the day and age where so many people just complain about problems and don't put themselves out there, you not only are fixing the problem, but you're out here, you're talking online, you're going out there and you're bringing it to the people. And that is such a scary thing to do that puts you out there and it opens you up for so much criticism and, and angst online and people, oh no, you don't do it that way. And right. you're sitting out here and you're doing it and you're making a difference and you're That's doing it the right way and we love your message. And so you are a hero. You are that person who went out and found the information that you need and you're bringing it out to the world. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for being on our show today. Thank you for, for being a person who is who is out there trying to make a difference and, and putting themselves out in that path. You are a hero to me. So thank you for being here today. Thank you so much. That was lovely. You're welcome. Any final words from you before we end our show today? No, you know, whenever I um, would do lives, I always say to my audience, to whoever is listening, that whatever you do out there in the world today, do it with kindness and do it with love. Beautiful, Absolutely. beautiful message. Love it. Perfect. Beautiful message. All right, audience, that is it for today. Thank you, DJ, for being here. Thank you, audience, for being here. Make sure you like and share because we want this message to get out there to all those parents who are worried, who are struggling, who are overwhelmed. Help them know that there are resources. There are people who care and really, really want to make their child's education the best it can be. So until next time, bye for now. Bye. Hello and welcome to Bringing Education Home. I'm Herb. And I'm Christina. And together we bring you experts